So I've been thinking about the difference between resume virtues and the eulogy virtues. The resume virtues are the ones you put on your resume, which、uh, are the skills you bring to the marketplace. The eulogy virtues are the ones that can mention the eulogy, which are deeper. Who are you? Are in your depth? What is the nature of your relationships? Are you bold, loving, dependable, consistency? And most of us, including me, would say that the eulogy virtues are the more important of the virtues. But at least in my case, are they the ones that I think about the most? And the answer is no. So I've been thinking about that problem. And a thinker who's helped me think about it is a guy named Joseph Soloveitchik, who was a rabbi who wrote a book called *The Lonely Man of Faith* in 1965. Soloveitchik said there are two sides of our natures, which he called Adam One and Adam Two. Adam One is the worldly, ambitious, external side of our nature. He wants to build, create, create companies, create innovation. Adam Two is the humble side of our nature. Adam Two not only to do good, but to be good, to live in a way internally that honors God, creation, and our possibilities. Adam one wants to conquer the world. Adam two wants to hear a calling and obey the world. Adam one savors accomplishment. Adam two savors inner consistency and strength. Adam one asks how things work. Adam two asks why we're here. Adam one's motto is success. Adam two's motto is love, redemption, and return. And Soloveitchik argued that these two sides of our nature are at war with each other, where you live in perpetual self-confrontation between the external success. And the internal value, and the tricky thing I'd say about these two sides of our nature is they work by different logics. The external logic is an economic logic: input leads to output, risk leads to reward. The internal side of our nature is a moral logic and often an inverse logic. You have to give to receive. You have to surrender to something outside yourself to gain strength within in yourself. You have to conquer desire to get what you want. In order to fulfill yourself, you have to forget yourself. In order to find yourself, you have to lose yourself. We happen to live in a society that favors Adam one, and often neglects Adam two. And the problem is that turns you into a shrewd animal, who treats life as a game, and you become a cold, calculating creature, who slips into a sort of mediocrity, where you realize there's a difference between your desired self and your actual self. You're not earning the sort of eulogy you want. You hope someone will give to you. You don't have the depth of conviction. You don't have an emotional sonorousness. You don't have commitment to tasks that would take more than a lifetime to commit. I was reminded of a common response through history of how you build a Sodom Adam II, how you build a depth of character. Through history, people have gone back into their own pasts, sometimes to a precious time in their life, to their childhood, and often. The mind gravitates in the past to a moment of shame, some sin committed, some act of selfishness, an act of omission or shallowness, the sin of anger, the sin of self-pity, trying to be a people pleaser, a lack of courage. Adam one is built by building on your strengths. Adam two is built by fighting your weaknesses. You go into yourself, you find the sin. Which you've committed over and again through your life, your signature sin, out of which the others emerge, and you fight that sin and you wrestle with that sin, and out of that wrestling, that suffering, then a depth of character is constructed. And we're often not taught to recognize the sin in ourselves, and we're not taught in this culture how to wrestle with it, how to confront it, and how to combat it. We live in a culture with an Adam One mentality. Where we're inarticulate about Adam II. Finally, Reinhold Niebuhr summed up the confrontation, the fully lived Adam I and Adam II life, this way: Nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. No virtuous act is quite as virtuous from the standpoint of our friend or foe as from our own standpoint. Therefore, we must be saved by that final form of love, which is forgiveness. Thanks.
So here we are, lecture 20, the last lecture for Earth 380 in the spring 2020 term. And I want to review some things that I hope you came away with after taking this class during the semester, and then leave you with some final parting thoughts, some random thoughts I have that hopefully will help you. I want to start with the image here, which you may have seen in some form at some point during your life. And I want to remind you that as a species, we have evolved unbelievably quickly in only the last few hundred years, if you think about several million years since we became bipedal. If you look back only a few thousand years ago at the Old Testament, we can see what we've called the metals of antiquity described in the Old Testament, gold, copper, silver, tin, lead, iron, mercury, that humans have used for thousands of years. And if we think of humans as one member of the animal kingdom, our use of natural resources is among the things that distinguishes us from all other members of the animal kingdom. I don't say that it makes us better. I don't say that it's good. But our use of natural resources, as we have come to know them today, is among the things that does make us unique on planet Earth. If we go from those seven metals of antiquity, it didn't take very long, considering the millions of years that we've evolved, to round out what we now know as the periodic table and our ability to separate and purify all 92 naturally occurring elements on planet Earth in ways that we can use them for our own betterment. So we now here in 2020 have 92 naturally occurring elements and we use them for an unbelievable number of products. This is a photograph taken a few years ago of my four kids, my two sons and my two daughters who are a few years older now, and my wife's grandmother who was born in 1918. 1918 was the end of World War I. It was a global war. It was the year that the Spanish flu actually started in the United States and the American military spread the Spanish flu to Europe and it had a second wave. It's something that we hear about today with respect to the current COVID-19 pandemic. My wife's grandmother was born in a small village in what is modern day Slovakia, where they had well water, they had no electricity, they had no modern convenience that we think of. I remember my wife's grandmother telling me stories of her older brother and how he was the first person within a hundred miles who had a radio and how big the antenna was and he strung the radio up and he operated it using a battery and people from all over the countryside came to their little farm to look at this box that was magical because out of that box came sound and I was really fortunate that she lived almost to 100 and my kids growing up when we would visit her she would tell them about her life at their age and they were absolutely amazed at what she described her life as a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, with what she thought was a great life, but of course lacked all of the things that we now, on average, take for granted. And I think that that's not a bad thing. On average in the developed world, we take this long list of things for granted because many of us have been born into a world where these things are provided. So we have a radio, a telephone, a television, a refrigerator, a freezer, indoor plumbing. How many of us have to worry about flushing the toilet and where that's going to go? We have air conditioning when it's hot and humid outside. We heat our homes, often with central air. We don't have to worry about felling trees and cutting timber. We don't burn coal inside of our homes as we once did throughout the United States. We see dentists on a regular basis. We have hospitals that treat us even if we can't pay. By law, they are required to triage and treat us. We have vaccines that have increased the longevity of human life everywhere that vaccines are used. We have antibiotics to kill bacteria in the body that previously would have caused us harm and often death. We have farm equipment that does the work of dozens of men in a matter of minutes what used to take us an entire day. We have commercial airplanes that have made the world very small. We have grocery stores that are stocked with food, so much food that the average American family now throws out about 40% of the food that we buy over the course of the year. 
because for many people food is so inexpensive that getting rid of that food does not cause any negative economic impact. When my wife's grandmother was born, she had access to none of this, and she lived long enough to see that this became the norm for much of the developed world. And I want to make sure people listening to this lecture recognize that around the world, there are more than one billion people who lack access to what we consider absolutely required in the United States, the European Union, Canada, and other developed countries. We know that access to all of these services and products and goods has also led to pollution. We know that the old adage, dilution is the solution to pollution, is patently false. When we build these small stacks here over coal-fired power plants or over smelters, we know that that smelting, that coal combustion, releases carbon dioxide, releases sulfur dioxide, releases heavy metals, including mercury, and we know that the Earth's atmosphere convex, we therefore know unequivocally, with zero doubt, that when we emit these pollutants, they have a global effect on everyone on the planet. We've seen this in real time. This is the cemetery in Chicago where you can visit and you can see these three statues. And from left to right, we can see the environmental degradation caused by combustion of coal and smelting and the release of sulfur dioxide that creates in the atmosphere sulfuric acid and ultimately increases the concentration of hydrogen ions in rain, which decreases pH and makes the rainwater acidic. And our grandparents and great-grandparents, if they lived in the United States and the European Union, we saw these statues on the right-hand side here. They lived this. This was their lived experience. And this stimulated that generation post-World War II in the 1950s and 1960s to push for change. And they ultimately pushed, and they were able to convince then Republican President Richard Nixon in 1970 to sign into legislation the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Environmental Protection Agency, all legislative framework designed to reduce the environmental degradation here at home in our own backyard. These were monumental legislative changes. These required bipartisan agreement between Democrats and Republicans. They did not happen by one political party forcing another political party to do something against their will. They truly happened because compromise worked. We saw this again in 1990 with the Clean Air Act amendments signed into law by Republican President George Bush Sr. And again, this was monumental because it was the Republican Party legislating environmental change and convincing Democrats in Congress that this needed to be done to further improve the atmosphere. We see the results. On the left-hand side, all of the red are hot spots for acid rain in 1990, the year that the Clean Air Act amendments were signed into law. And on the right-hand side, we see in 2013, the almost complete absence of those red hot spots. So we know that domestically within the United States this worked, but we also know that industry moved overseas and there was pollution transfer to parts of Asia and Africa and Central America and South America. So we didn't legislate ourselves perfectly to clean air. We legislated ourselves to clean air domestically and we saw a significant decline in the emissions of sulfur dioxide from coal-fired power plants. But we also know that we displaced and moved some of this pollution overseas to other countries. So we know that compromise works. Compromise is something that seems to be missing today in the political arena in the United States. And my hope is that your generation grows up and is much stronger than mine and that you return to an era where compromise can work again. We know that regulations work. So here are the data that I mentioned a minute ago. This is the electric power industry, sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxide emissions by the combustion of fuel, and the fuels here are coal, petroleum or oil, and natural gas. And we can see a precipitous decline in the emissions at home. 
And remember that electricity is not something that we transferred to other countries. Certainly more electricity was consumed in other countries when factories were built to produce the goods that were exported back here for us to consume. But the decline that you see here, this is telling us that legislation at home that put regulations on the 600 plus coal-fired power plants in the United States worked to reduce emissions. But what happened? Well, we saw initially, if we look in the center here at China, we saw after the Clean Air Act amendments in 1990, we see a significant increase in sulfur dioxide emissions for a number of sectors, where you can see the legend on right is the sector for SO2 emissions. But then what do we see here around 2006, 2007? We see in China, we see the people of China pushing back on national leadership, pushing back on the Communist Party, telling national leadership that they no longer want that pollution in the coastal cities of Beijing and Shanghai and other population centers. And we see China reach that turning point where if you follow the economic news, China now wants to transition to a service industry, exactly what happened in the United States within the last generation. Now that requires a number of things, including most likely pollution transfer to Western China and other countries. If we look at the figure on the right, we see India. India is one of the two most populous countries on earth, one and a half billion people. And we see India today, depending on what statistics you believe, as many as two to three hundred million people lack access to reliable, sustainable electricity 24-7, 365. India has a tremendous domestic resource of brown coal, which is a low carbon, high sulfur coal, and India has made the choice to build coal-fired power plants within the last generation to produce electricity to electrify the entire country. There was a lot of effort during the Obama eight-year administration to work with India to look at other ways of providing electricity. Among them, nuclear power, and today there's a lot of interest on the part of the international community to work with India to develop renewable energy resources such as solar and wind. So again, there's a lot of great work to be done, and your generation, the people listening to this lecture, you are in a perfect position to take on this work and accomplish great things. Again, I showed this slide earlier in the class, and I just want to point out when you hear the rhetoric today that is anti-regulation, if you just focus at the blue and we go back a hundred years, notice the precipitous decline in the number of coal miners who died in accidents at work. And again, on the right, we have the years and we have congressional legislative acts that were put in place that forced coal mining companies to enact more stringent safety protocols and they worked. I have never met a relative in West Virginia who is in the coal mining industry who tells me they want to roll back all of these regulations and go back a hundred years when we had tens of thousands of people die every single year in the United States. But what do we see today? Today we see a tremendous amount of political rhetoric at the national, the state, and the local level across the United States, and we see this around the world. We see the current Republican administration wanting to roll back so many environmental rules that we know were incredibly beneficial. Environmental rules that were signed into legislation by Republican presidents in previous administrations. The list seems to be almost endless. Almost every day I wake up and I find some news story about a new rule that the new administration wants to roll back. And it really perplexes me because as someone who has spent a lot of time studying the history of the economic evolution of the United States and how we had to reach our turning point, it really perplexes me that we could have anyone in Washington, D.C. want to roll back the environmental regulations that have worked so well to clean up the environment in our own backyard. And again, if you fall prey to the news stories that cast this in a positive light, I'll remind you that all of those environmental regulations going back decades, all of the data from economists tell us they had a positive impact on economic growth in the United States. So we've experienced this before. 
This was Ronald Reagan, a two-term president from 1981 to 1989. And I'll let you read this quote. It seems very appropriate considering what our current president tweets almost every day. In the present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Ronald Reagan championed what many view on the Republican side of the political aisle as anti-government. And it's very different than Republicans before Reagan and also George Bush and George Bush Jr. after Reagan. And the concept here was to effectively eliminate regulations in toto. There should be no regulations on capitalism. And we know that that has an horrific effect on the environment. And we also know that the environmental regulations do not hinder economic growth. So if you go back to 1981, Reagan had what he called his Gang of Three, and he proposed eliminating the EPA. He wanted the EPA to be done away with so that we could effectively eliminate the Clean Air Act, eliminate the Clean Water Act. And there were many on the Republican Party side who adamantly opposed Ronald Reagan. And thank God, those people in the Republican Party were able to convince him, and importantly, convince members of the Senate and the House of Representatives not to allow deregulation to take place. Ronald Reagan completely dismissed acid rain as a viable concept. What we hear today, the anti-science rhetoric from President Trump, we heard also from Ronald Reagan. And now we know that acid rain was caused by combustion of coal and smelting. We know exactly how it was caused. And we also know that legislation, regulatory framework, coupled with cap and trade, that it worked to eliminate acid rain. You hear a lot of rhetoric about Obama killing coal. I showed you this only a few lectures ago. And just as a reminder, it was under Republican President Ronald Reagan that more coal miners lost their job than under any president since World War II. So when you hear Trump digs coal, please know that that's patently false. He's pandering to people in areas of the country where coal mining is almost legend. If we go back to the Appalachian Mountains three or four hundred years ago, nobody moved there for coal. But after the Industrial Revolution and after we figured out how to use coal and combust it to drive pistons and to produce electricity at coal-fired power plants, Appalachia was put on the map and it became the destination for a lot of immigrants from Europe and other countries. And that is now part of folklore in, in Appalachia. But Trump does not dig coal. Trump wants voters, and so he's pandering. If we look at coal production, again a slide you've seen before, in red is coal production in West Virginia, and in blue are the number of people who actually work earning a paycheck mining coal. And you can see the disparity on the right-hand side of the slide. And that's because after World War II, right around a time frame of around 1950, coal mining companies started eliminating or firing or laying off coal miners because they could use mechanized equipment to do more work per hour than the men and women they hired to do the work. So coal production plateaued or increased depending on the year, and fewer people were hired. If we look at what is commonly reported in the newspaper and on Fox News and other media outlets, Barack Obama is victimized as having been the killer of coal, and it's just not true. Again, you saw this slide before, but I just want to make the point that if you look at the blue and you look at the red lines, they're effectively identical. And what they tell us is that before the EPA and after the EPA, the number of coal mining jobs was effectively the same. It had nothing to do with legislative framework. What is actually killing coal is purely economic. It's capitalism. It's exactly the thing that President Trump and the Republican Party champion, and I myself have championed. If we look at what's killing coal, where coal is the dark blue line up on the top, we can see coal in your lifetime in the United States has declined and natural gas has inclined. And why is natural gas inclining? It's because of hydraulic fracturing and directional drilling. So I played this video a few lectures ago, 
and I wanted you to have a high level understanding of what hydraulic fracturing is, commonly referred to as fracking. And remember, fracking was ideated, directional drilling was ideated, and it was driven by capitalism. It was driven by companies who wanted to access more natural gas, more oil in unconventional reservoirs. And as a result, they got what they wanted. And you can see here in terms of million cubic feet, U.S. natural gas marketed production, if we go back to 1900, you can see it increases, increases. It plateaued for roughly 40 years. And over here where I'm tracing with the laser pointer, that is the growth of hydraulic fracturing in unconventional natural gas reservoirs around the United States. And you can see that almost overnight within a few years, the amount of natural gas increased by almost 50%. And this increase by almost 50% created a glut in the natural gas market where there was an oversupply. If natural gas produces more kilowatt hours per unit, then electricity companies around the country switched from coal to natural gas, and that killed coal. When we look at a Green New Deal, and I think a Green New Deal has certain aspects that I fully support, what does the Green New Deal call for? 100% of U.S. primary energy to be replaced with renewables. We know we can do this. We know wind turbines can work. We know solar panels can work. We know grid-scale battery storage can work. And we know that the emissions that result from producing electricity from these technologies are orders of magnitude lower than the emissions from coal and natural gas. We also now know that the cheapest way of generating electricity in many, if not most, markets in the United States and throughout the world is a combination of wind and solar. And if you look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, often referred to as SDGs, there are 17 of those. And I just highlight number seven is affordable and clean energy. Now remember the United Nations, this is a global entity. This is not just the United States. The United Nations Sustainability Goals call for no poverty. They call for zero hunger. They call for clean water and sanitation sustainable cities and communities, climate action. And among the aspects that this class focused on are the resources necessary to create a sustainable, viable, clean energy infrastructure around the world. And without any doubt, we can achieve that within your lifetime if we want to. But we need resources. So we spent a lot of the first part of this class talking about copper, Here's the Statue of Liberty in New York's harbor, covered in copper. It's now this beautiful green patina color, and that color is used by exploration geologists to find copper in other places around the world. We can see our electricity infrastructure in the center, and the backbone of that are wires made of copper, or in the case of high voltage transmission, aluminum. When we look at copper consumption, and copper was one of the Oh, shit. If we look at the amount of copper that we've consumed since 1900, remembering that copper is a metal of antiquity, we had the Copper Age before we had the Bronze Age, before we had the Iron Age, and our use of copper is what took us from the Stone Age into modernity. If we look at all of the copper consumed since the dawn of the Copper Age, between the two red lines, from 1945 to 1995, we consumed, meaning the global we, humanity, we consumed 80% of all copper ever mined, which means that from the dawn of the Copper Age, way off to the left thousands of years ago, all the way to 1945, was 20% of the copper ever mined. And then what happened in 1945, post-World War II? We started building our modern built infrastructure, the environment that for most people on a good thing we take for granted. And if we project forward, we know we need a lot more copper. So if we want to power all of our homes and businesses, all of the electricity in the United States would require more than a million wind turbines 
and additional capacity for battery electric vehicles. We'd have to replace all of our natural gas heating and all of our natural gas hot water. We know that no matter how people vote in the United States, they prefer renewable energy because renewable energy is less expensive. It's cheaper. So when we look at these states up here at the top, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Kansas, Oklahoma, all of those states voted Republican in 2016. Texas, Nebraska, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho. If you look at these states, they are producing now as much as a quarter to a third of their electricity only from renewables. And we know that will continue to increase because renewables are cheaper. We know that all of these renewables require new resources. So I showed you this in the last lecture. And again, in hybrid cars, if we imagine everybody drives a battery electric vehicle, we know that we will need additional resources. We know we'll need them for solar panels. And if we project out how much new copper we'll need over the next few decades, the forecasts are that we will need new copper, meaning primary mined copper, or what is sometimes referred to as virgin copper, we will need to increase by 200% all of the copper we have ever consumed to 2020, which means that we do have to continue to explore for and find new volumes of Earth's crust to extract copper. We have to find more volumes of Earth's crust that contain rocks like this that contain chalcopyrite that we mine at Bingham Canyon. And we have to make sure that all of the waste stream, the sulfur dioxide that is produced during smelting, we scrub that and we do not emit admit that to the atmosphere. That we build tailings ponds so the dams don't fail and cause economic and catastrophic loss of human lives and destruction of flora and fauna downstream. When we look around the world, I'm not at all worried that there's enough copper to do this. So this is the reserves to production or years left of copper since 1900. And the two peaks here, these were two peaks caused by significant decline in copper production because of mine closures around the world. If we ignore those, then the years left of copper has essentially remained between 30 and 60 for the last 120 years. And if we look at estimates of how much copper there still remains to be mined, there is far more than 200%. We know that when we look at battery electric vehicles, we know we'll need metals to make these battery electric vehicles viable for a global citizenship. We know we'll need metals like lithium. So here we have in the background, the dark gray is steel and the black is lithium. We currently consume about 400% more lithium per year than we did in 1960. And we know that we'll need to increase that even more to build more battery electric vehicles. In the last lecture, I mentioned rare earths. We currently consume 5,000% more per year rare earths than we did in 1960. In 1960, there were no laptops. There were no smartphones. There were no LED or plasma screen televisions. There were no battery electric vehicles, no Tesla. And so all of our built environment today, the infrastructure that we have come to take for granted requires these. It will require mining. It will require emphasis on minimizing environmental degradation in the developing world where most of the rare earth metals will be produced. I mentioned one billion people throughout the world that lack electricity. And the map here, the darker colors correlate with places where higher percentages of the citizens of those countries lack electricity. You can see many countries in Asia. You can see most of Africa, several countries in South America and Central America. These are parts of the world where I feel it is our moral imperative to make sure and help the citizens of these countries achieve the infrastructure they want to achieve because what goes along with the infrastructure that we have in the developed world are a number of things, not just life expectancy, but many others. Gender equality, empowerment of women to do work outside of the house, 
These are issues that are major concerns in much of the developing world. And electricity is one of the factors that will help improve life outcomes. One of my former students, Daniel Corfay, on the left-hand side, here's a picture of Daniel. He was born and raised in Liberia and is currently a professor of geology at the University of Liberia. I was blessed to have Daniel work with me for two years and learned more about Africa through Daniel's eyes than I could ever have learned reading as many books as are contained in any library on the planet. Liberia, as a country, more than 75% of its citizens lack electricity. And that's not because they don't want electricity. It's not that they don't want all the things that come with electricity. As Daniel explained to me, Liberia as an infrastructure was decimated by two civil wars that he lived through. The lack of electricity means the lack of wastewater. There are no toilets that just flush and send that water somewhere to be cleaned. There are no hot water heaters that allow the water to be warm enough that it can be used to kill bacteria on the skin when you wash with soap. It's not just air conditioning and things that we take for granted with electricity, but it's the basics that would make Liberia a better country moving forward and empower the citizens of Liberia to achieve what they are capable of achieving. There are lots of things that correlate with access to energy and specifically electricity. If we look here at child mortality from 1751 to 2013 for the five countries shown on the right hand side, you can look here that certainly there are ups and downs. It's not a perfectly smooth curve, but notice the child mortality, which is the percentage of children who died before the age of five. If we go back to 1750, roughly three out of 10 children born died before the age of five. If we go back to Canada, only a 100 years ago, roughly 15 out of 100 children died before the age of five. In South Korea, in 1960, three out of 10 children died before the age of five. And they were dying of things that today, children do not die from in the developed world. We can see the precipitous decline in child mortality in Ethiopia and Chile. And these correlate with access to energy. Life expectancy around the world has increased significantly in only the last few hundred years. If we go back to the late 1700s, in Africa, Asia, the Americas, Europe, the world average in dark black, the average life expectancy was less than 40 years old. Now this included children who die before the age of five. And yes, there were plenty of people who lived to be 60 and 70 and 80. But if we look at the average life expectancy today for people born in 2020, the average female and male born in the United States in 2020 will live to be 80 plus years old, which means that we have increased life expectancy by more than a factor of two, and energy consumption is part of this. Part of this also is calorie consumption. Whether you're a fan of the locavore movement, whether you're a fan of big agriculture, if we look at the yields of food around the world, and we think about how much access we have to food on average, and I don't in any way mean here to denigrate the food deserts that are huge challenges for many people in the United States and around the world, but on average, we can see for the world on the right-hand side, the average consumption of calories per day has increased, and this is because large agriculture has made food cheaper. This has resulted in a decrease in undernourishment in the developed world. So if we look at the percentage of people in developing countries who are undernourished, we can see that throughout the world, no matter what region you look at, all regions, we can see the number of people who suffer undernourishment is declining. It is far from perfect. There is still a lot of work that needs to be done, but without a doubt, the data tell us that undernourishment is improving. The number of people who live in extreme poverty is declining year over year. Much of this is due to work by the World Health Organization, the United Nations, 
a variety of philanthropic organizations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and many, 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 many others. We see the world population living in extreme poverty dropping year over year. We can see poverty in the United States is also improving. So if we look at the percentage of people who are poor in the United States, and again, I don't mean to say there are not problems. Absolutely there are. But across the country, we see vast improvements over the last several generations. So how do we ensure a sustainable supply of resources for modern society? If you agree with me that it is our moral imperative to allow the entire world access to achieve what the developed world has achieved, how do we actually ensure that? When we talk about sustainability, what does that mean? One of the things it means is that we have to explore for and mine new mineral deposits. We have to make sure the metals that are necessary for building the renewable energy infrastructure are available. And we also have to do a better job at recycling the metals we've already mined. This is a periodic table where the colors correspond to the percent of each metal globally that is recycled. The darkest colors mean a metal is recycled at a rate greater than 50%. So if we think about a metal and we recycle it at 50%, that means that 50% of the metal that we have mined and embedded in a product is landfilled. It's thrown away. This is atrocious. It's not just my opinion. It defies logic to think that we will spend the time exploring for a new mineral deposit, building a mine infrastructure, getting the environmental permits, gaining the social license to mine that particular volume of earth, extracting the metal, purifying the metal by electrolytic refining or another technology, embedding that metal in a resource, and then simply throwing it away. The concept of a disposable society is something we have to move beyond. When I look at the latest earbuds that Apple markets, they are not recyclable. Apple anticipates that the battery will last 18 months. Apple does not recycle any of the metals inside those earbuds, so they anticipate that after 18 months, those earbuds will end up in the trash. I don't think that's the way we should behave as a global society. I think we need engineers and we need environmental groups that push for new technology that allow recycling rates for all of these metals to be 100%. So the last part of today's lecture, I want to just give you some random thoughts. I'll tell you that as I've recorded these lectures over the spring term in my basement studio, I've really missed the energy of being in a classroom live with students. I love walking around classrooms. I love connecting with students. I love reading students' body language. I love looking at your eyes. I love seeing the nods. And I really enjoy over the course of a normal semester on campus having students visit me during office hours. And I just want to give you some final random thoughts that hopefully will help you think about your own future. We're now in this COVID-19 global pandemic, and we can see people wearing masks, afraid that they don't want to contract the virus. We see plenty of people not wearing the masks. And in the United States, mask wearing or not mask wearing has almost become political. If you're Republican, and your president doesn't wear a mask, you're not going to wear one either because somehow you're immune. The scientists may not be correct. Why believe in science? Reagan didn't believe in acid rain. Why should we believe that we can wear masks and protect COVID-19? So if you read the text here, this is about a now famous scientist, a medical doctor named Ignaz Semmelweis. And he had this crazy idea in the middle of the 1800s that in a hospital in Europe, doctors would perform autopsies of dead patients, and then they would go into the maternity ward to deliver babies from live mothers. And he noticed that when doctors performed autopsies and then delivered babies, that the number of mothers and babies who died within days to weeks was incredibly large compared to the mothers and babies where the babies were born when doctors did not perform autopsies. 
So Semmelweis had this radical idea at the time that it might be that the doctors, when they performed autopsies, on their hands were carrying germs, and then when they delivered the baby, they transferred those germs to the baby and to the mother. Now, he was ridiculed. He ultimately ended up being committed to an insane asylum where the guards beat him to death. He became crazy because he was ridiculed. Think about this today with COVID-19 and how many commercials you've seen about using warm water and soap and washing for 20 seconds. This was only 150 years ago. And here we have a scientist who was ridiculed for suggesting to wash your hands when performing deliveries. As a result of Semmelweis, if we look at data now going back 100 years, nobody listening to this lecture could imagine going to the hospital and allowing a doctor to perform any medical procedure on you without washing their hands. Absolutely not you would run from the hospital before you would allow them to perform a medical procedure without washing their hands. And we see here the precipitous decline in the number of babies who died as a result of the lack of hygiene. We also saw life expectancy increase. It works on the other end of life. So when we think about all of the people today that are ridiculing the mask wearing and saying that we don't need to have social distancing. We don't need to look very far back in history to see that pattern repeat over and over and over again. Now, in terms of how this becomes political, one of the things we also see in the United States is that maternal health care in rural America, so small towns, farm communities, and tragically on reservations where indigenous communities, Native Americans, are being adversely affected by a lack of access to maternal health care. And we see the data that show us here, if you look at the various colors, large cities in purple on the left, and most rural in dark green on the right of each of these. And you can see that the maternal mortality rates and the infant mortality rates are highest so here we have maternal mortality rates and infant mortality rates. They are highest, statistically significantly higher in rural communities. And that's because healthcare in the United States is becoming so expensive that in most rural communities now, hospitals and clinics struggle to survive. And this becomes political. And the thing that absolutely amazes me is the Republican Party, the capitalist party, is opposed to universal health care and the absence of universal universal health care and affordable health care is the cause for these mortality rates climbing in rural America and yet rural America votes for that party. We see now this whole anti-vaxxer movement and if we look here at the data for vaccines we can see all of these diseases in the center column here most of these diseases, people listening to this call in the United States and in much of the world, we have seen an almost 100% for all of these decline. And you can see for several, they have declined by 100%. If you think about something like smallpox and you read, you read historical fiction from the 16, 17, 1800s, you'll see smallpox in many, 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 many books. It affected millions of people around the world. The, small the smallpox vaccine has effectively eradicated smallpox in the United States. And yet today we have people saying we should not vaccinate. And yet when we look at the data, who would want to see a rise in any of the these diseases? Certainly not me. And yet we see this. This is an article from last year in Samoa where there was a measles outbreak and yet one of the challenges was an anti-vaxxer movement that was telling people not to get vaccinated. When I mentioned earlier poverty, this is just another snapshot of the world population living in absolute poverty. And again, we see this precipitous decline. We know the world is getting better. Now a few words for you. Don't live your life in bubble wrap. 
One of the things I've seen in my career, I started my PhD program almost 20 years ago this week, and I've been teaching classes at universities for about that time. And one of the things I've seen over 20 years is an increase in the number of students at your age, college age students, who walk around in bubble wrap, absolutely terrified that somebody might say something that even remotely offends you. And it has led not only to a lack of compromise, but it has led to what people call an echo chamber, where we pretend that we should be silent. If anybody says anything that offends you, they are absolutely wrong and should be cast out from society. We've become a culture that cancels anyone when they say anything that disagrees with what we believe. And my personal opinion is that is not a society that's healthy. There has been much written about this. This was an op-ed a few years ago from a New York Times writer, Nicholas Kristof, who wrote about the dangers of echo chambers on campus. And you can pause this and come back to it and read this. But I will tell you that at the University of Michigan in 2012, I have been astonished at my own faculty colleagues and staff and students who only want to live in an echo chamber, as I lovingly refer to it, the Ann Arbor bubble. They want you to think like them, to talk like them, to look like them, to walk like them, to behave like them. They put signs in the front yard because that's what's become popular, but they don't really want to change. They just want everyone to change to be just like them. This echo chamber is incredibly dangerous. I think among the most beautiful things about humans as a species is our ability to agree to disagree and to do that politely. When universities are echo chambers, they become conservative punchlines and liberal hand-wringing may be one reason Trump's popularity has jumped since his election. We see this now across the United States. We see universities and liberal academic towns in the crosshairs of many conservatives where they truly think that if something is academic, it means that it's irrelevant. And I don't think that liberals, on the whole, fully understand this. So what do I encourage you to do, each of you listening to this lecture? I encourage you to be different. Don't always feel that you have to fit somebody else's mold. Be your own mold. Be different. Be you. Read a paper every day, even if you skim. And I know today many of us don't get newspapers delivered in the driveway as we imagine seeing them on antiquated movies. But keep up with the news to at least be able to have an intelligible conversation about news. If you are blessed to live somewhere where you can vote, vote every time you have the opportunity. I've been blessed in my career to do work on all seven continents. I've traveled to about 70 countries. I've been to several dozen developing countries. And I can tell you that when I meet people in countries where they cannot vote, they look at our ability to vote, to elect our leaders, as an absolute fantasy that they would love to have. So if you have the ability to vote, please don't say something like, my vote does not matter. Every vote matters, and I encourage you to vote. And vote as an informed citizen. Don't vote the way your parents tell you to vote. Don't vote the way your friends tell you to vote. Read about who's running and vote for who you want to vote for. Engage others. I see so many students on campus walking around with earbuds in their ears all the time. As soon as class is over, the earbuds go in and music is playing. Take the earbuds out and have a conversation. Engage others. Say hello. Challenge others. If someone says something that you don't agree with, have a polite conversation and challenge them. Don't cancel them. Don't immediately cast them out, but challenge them. Do not accept the status quo. Just because a group of others want something doesn't mean you have to want the same thing. Push for the change that you want to see. Fact check your belief system. Don't accept something that you don't necessarily believe is true. Fact check it and change your belief system. One of the greatest things about humans as we grow older 
is the ability to look back with what we often think of as 2020 vision, change your belief system as you change and evolve. And don't surround yourself with echoes. Now I know it's only natural that we become friends with people who have similar interests and likes and wants, but it's also good to surround yourself with people who have differing opinions and check your own opinions. I've been really fortunate throughout my career to have recruited a lot of fantastic graduate, stu graduate students, domestic students, international students, students of color, students from different backgrounds, indigenous American backgrounds. And I will tell you, as someone who grew up in North Carolina in a very racially segregated town, on the side of the tracks with the socioeconomically disadvantaged uh, citizens in my city, I am really fortunate to have been surrounded in academia over the last 15 years with people from all walks of life that make me better than I was. I showed you this. And I meant to only emphasize that we used to have to spend a lot more time doing work than we do now. So we went from 60 hours a week to 25 hours a week. If you go back 100 years and you read work by John Maynard Keynes, considered among the greatest economists ever to live, he predicted that we would eventually end up with a 15-hour work week. And it would create lots of problems for us because we'd be so bored we wouldn't know what to do. I encourage all of you to develop hobbies. Make sure you have things that you enjoy doing outside of work and outside of school. Have friends that you enjoy doing those things with. A big concern I have and many others focuses on this concept is workism our new God. I have friends in the real world who brag about not taking all of their vacation time every year. And I'm always stunned. If you have three weeks of vacation time, why would you not take three weeks of vacation time? Spend that with your spouse, your friends, your children. I view vacation time as a time to recharge my batteries, and I find that it's absolutely amazing. It is my drug to recharge during vacation time. But we now have this belief that work is not only necessary to economic production, but also the centerpiece of one's identity and life's purpose. Don't get trapped in that. Don't get trapped in the capitalist view that value equals productivity. It does not. You can read lots of studies by social psychologists where $75,000 is when the correlation between happiness and salary stops. So what that means is if you make $75,000 and you are at some level of happiness, and you then make 76,000, 77,000, 78,000, your happiness does not improve. And I encourage you to look into the literature on this. There are lots of great podcasts that focus on this. And my advice is to decouple your self-value from your vocation. Find something that you're passionate about, that you enjoy doing, and focus on that as your career. No matter how much money you earn, the goal is to have a lifestyle that you enjoy and something that when you wake up in the morning, you want to go in and you want to spend your time doing. Evaluate who you are as a person and what makes you feel good about yourself. Don't pick a career because your parents want you to pick that career. Don't pick a career because your friends want that career. Pick the career that you really feel you're passionate about and follow a career path that doesn't have to be linear. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Failure is among the things that can lead to success. If you never fail, you likely don't know what success is. Don't be fooled by the gospel of meritocracy. You hear a lot that the best test takers are the ones who get the best jobs. That's bullshit. Surround yourself by people. Get to know people. Network. Introduce yourself. Do as much as you can to make sure people know who you are so that when the right opportunity presents itself, you're ready to take that opportunity. And be okay with the silver medal. This is something I've read a lot about over the last few years, and I'd be happy to provide people with links for this if you want. There have been many studies looking back at the history of the Olympics, a global competition, where we all typically think of the gold medal winner 
in her or his sport as the elite athlete, number one. Nobody is as good as the gold medal winner. And I had always thought the person who won the silver medal should feel amazing because they're number two in the entire world. And yet, if you look at the data surrounding silver medalists, what we find is that they have shorter lifespans, they suffer more depression, they have higher rates of suicide, and it's because as a silver medalist, they were so close to being number one, and yet when they did not win the gold medal, they can never, ever recover. Now, in the case of the bronze medalist, the bronze medalists are almost equally as happy lifelong as the gold medalist because for the bronze medalist, they know that they were almost not even on the medal podium. So as, as you go through life, be okay with the silver medal. Be okay with not being number one. Fuck it. Everybody doesn't have to be number one. It's okay to be number two or number 10 or number 50. As long as you're happy doing what you're doing, that's the goal in life. Make yourself happy. Develop intrinsic reward systems. The extrinsic reward system is what a lot of social psychologists refer to as sweatshirt envy. What college name do I have on my shirt? Now, I don't mean here that you shouldn't be proud of going to Michigan. I'll tell you since joining the faculty at the University of Michigan in 2012, I've traveled around the world. And if I have something on that says Michigan, all of a sudden I'll hear, go blue. And I've had a number of great conversations with people in airports in Beijing, airports in Accra, airports in Santiago, airports in Muscat. And I'll have these conversations, and they're fantastic. But when I see people feel that the label makes them who they are, I get concerned. So develop an intrinsic reward system. What makes you happy? What career is going to make you happy to get up and go to work? That's the focus. That should be the goal in life. And that's it. So we've had 20 lectures of Earth 380 in the spring term. They've been delivered from my basement studio. And I will tell you, I certainly wish I could have taught this class on campus so I could see each of your faces and try and read your body language. I really hope that the lectures have made a connection. I really hope they've given you some insight into who we are, how we've gotten here. I want you to remember the billion people without electricity. I want you to remember the developing countries around the world. We don't want them to suffer the resource curse. I want you to help push for the change that we know is the right change for our global society moving forward. Thank you.